So have you ever felt like you were in a dry and weary land? Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about the Southwest where people think that 115 degrees is okay as long as the heat is dry or the you know, humidity. I'm not talking about that kind of dry and weary land. I will stick to 98 degrees and 112% humidity in Arkansas every day. That's okay. But have you ever felt like you were in a dry and weary land within yourself, inside of you, a dry and weary land within your very soul, and it just seemed like there was no refreshing to be found? that there was no refreshing, that you were spiritually parched, and there was no living water inside of you. You know, that living water is an interesting one. In John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well who had come there for one thing, but he gave her another, something far superior. She was coming only for water to drink, but Jesus was willing to provide her with living water that would sustain her forever. And so the question is, do you need that living water? Are you parched and dry on the inside where it looks like there is no hope. You know, King David talks about this very thing in Psalm 63. And David is the David of David and Goliath, but he talks about a dry and weary land. And there are dry and weary lands, of course, especially in ancient times, water was so necessary out in the desert. It was, in fact, the lifeblood of ancient caravans that would be traveling through the deserts. This was an absolute necessity. This is why finding an oasis in the desert was so important. And we, in fact, in Job chapter 6, verse 19, we find it talking about the oasis of Tema, which was a popular and vital rest stop as you had uh, Sabaean travelers going from the north to south down through the Arabian desert. Their camels, they could last about a week or so without water, which is kind of amazing in and of itself. But after a week, they have got to find water. And so as they're traveling down in these caravans, if they come to a watering hole that they expected to find water in, but it was dry, it was a death sentence. There was nothing there. They wouldn't be able to live. They wouldn't make it to the next oasis. And so they were struggling with that kind of thing in those days. And so a man named Job, whom we talked about last week, was probably very familiar with these kinds of caravans. In fact, when you look at Job chapter 1, verse 3, we see that he was the richest man in the Middle East at that time. No doubt he had a lot of dealings with those kinds of caravans that were coming back and forth throughout the desert. In fact, he probably visited Timah himself, considering it was only about 300 miles southeast of Edom, where most experts think that Job lived. But in any case, in Job chapter 6, verse 14, Job... Job describes a dry and weary land, but in a different way. Job is using this picture of a dry and weary land in the oasis of Timah as a metaphor for something that's going on in his life. Job describes the disappointment that he has over friends that did not show kindness to him when he needed it. Friends that he went to that needed an oasis, and so much like a caravan showing up for water but found it empty. Job is experiencing this with the people in his life. We read about it in Job chapter 6. If you have your Bible, by the way, the book of Job, you'll find it's almost in the middle of your Bible. If you were to go to the middle, you'll probably find Psalms. If you go backwards one chapter, you'll find the book of Job. I'm going to read from chapter 6 for just a minute. Here's where we go. Job 6, 14 and following. He who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers are treacherous, as a torrent bed, as torrential streams that pass away, which are dark with ice, and where the snow hides itself. When they melt, they disappear. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The caravans turn aside from their course. They go up into the waste, and they perish. The caravans of Timah look. The travelers of Sheba hope. They are ashamed because they were confident they would come there, and, but they were disappointed. For you have now become nothing. You see my calamity and you are afraid. So in a similar way, as Job tells this story, in a similar way, whose enemy, by the way, is the devil, who comes and basically takes everything away from Job that Job has. And so in this way, Job then turns to his friends in his hour of need. He's lost everything. And he goes to his friends in his hour of need. He goes to his friends expecting to find a much-needed rest, an oasis, if you will. He goes there for that, a refreshment for the soul. But to his shock, when he gets to his friends, the friends, instead of giving him comfort, they give him criticism and condescending. They respond with nastiness and hurtful things. 
They're speaking as if they know what God is up to in his life as he's struggling with having lost everything. And they speak presumptuously about God as whether or not God is just or not. And then they speak about Job to Job who's just lost everything when Job needs his friends to comfort him and give him peace and an oasis, a refreshing. And instead they accuse him of sin, that this is on you. You did this to yourself. And I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but that hurts. It cuts like a knife when you go to a friend for comfort in the time of trial, and all they do is hurt you more. You know, i got to be honest and tell you, I've been there probably on both sides of that. If I have to be really honest, I know that it's true. There have been times in my life where I was in desperate need of refreshing that I was in a desperate place of needing refreshing from a dry and weary season in life or even in ministry where I needed someone to come alongside and give me a comforting word, to give me hope, to have a friend that would give me a hug and tell me it's going to be okay, especially if I'd made a mistake somewhere along the way. And so often I have found people who were unwilling to bring the comfort and peace. So often it's been to be able to put a finger on why the mistake happened and fail to bring refreshing. But I also say that I'm sure there have been times, in fact, I know there have been, times in my life that I just wasn't willing to be the oasis for other people that were struggling. That there were times that maybe I just felt like someone created their own problem or they did the same thing over and over and over again. Or maybe they just didn't listen to my advice or whatever it was, and all I wanted to say was, I told you so. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I'm guessing most of you have been in that place before. Someone around you that continued to make the same mistake, and it was hard to bring comfort. It was hard to bring the refreshing. It was hard to be the oasis in the middle of whatever desert they were finding themselves in. And we just wanted to go, yeah, I told you so. I told you so. I'm sure there have been just times that I was feeling calloused instead of compassionate, gruff instead of gracious, complaining instead of cheering, critical instead of comforting, loathing instead of loving, and all those things and probably more, if I have to be honest. And maybe that's because I'd had a bad day. Maybe it's because I was hangry. That happens, right? Maybe it's because I was tired, because sometimes when we're tired, we say extra dumb things, yes? And sometimes maybe it was because I was people-weary or I was dry and weary myself. And when you are dry and weary, it's hard to overflow life and living water into somebody else who's dry and weary. It's hard. There have been those times. You know, a critical spirit, which is this idea that everything around is dumb. People are dumb. Things are dumb. People make mistakes. Everything is messed up. Sort of the Eeyore of the world, you know, it's going to not work. It'll never will. That critical spirit that sees the negative in everything, that is no fun to be around, and it's certainly no fun to have as a personality trait, because out of a critical spirit, all kinds of things come, like grumbling. Grumbling is one of the great things and terrible things that comes out of a critical spirit. It's that mumbling and muttering and murmuring and growling, that protesting with a bad attitude, that's what grumbling is. It is all of that nastiness and negativity with situations in life, and that hardly fits into the fruit of the Spirit. Would you agree? If we think about the fruit of the Spirit, the grumbling is not in there. I think some people must think that it is, but in fact, grumbling is the opposite and does everything it possibly can to destroy the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. It fights against those things. And maybe you can relate to this in your own lives. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've been on one side or the other. Maybe you've had times where you desperately needed support. You desperately needed someone to come alongside and give you comfort in a dry season, but the people around you instead were critical and complaining and condescending. Or maybe you've had times where it was you that was critical and complaining and condescending to people and maybe even to God himself. Those times are hard. You know, a grumbling, condescending, critical tongue is not exactly hard to miss. We can see it easy. 
in our lives, in the lives of others. We know it when we're around it. You can hear it and know exactly what it is. Of course, grumbling, that kind of thing, that's not always verbal either, is it? You can see someone grumbling, murmuring, muttering just in their face. How people might roll their eyes or my favorite, that one. You don't even need words to grumble. Sometimes we can do it that easy just with how our face looks. And guess what? It happens everywhere, and you know it happens everywhere, including in our churches. It happens in churches all the time, even this one. And usually it's about something when change needs to happen. People grumble about change all the time. It's how the world is. Everybody says it. Change is hard. Well, what that really is is an opportunity for people to vent and grumble and be frustrated. And it can be over simple things like asking people to wear name tags. Not that anyone here would do that. But simple things. Or talk about tithing. That's usually a big grumbling day. We talk about tithing. It's interesting, too, because tithing is a topic that's talked about the most out of any single topic in the Bible. And yet so many people, when they hear that as a message, because if you have a topic that's talked about more than any other topics, you probably should talk about it in the Bible. Right? This would make sense. But then when you talk about it, so many people just grumble. And they go, you just want our money, you're just talking about it. You know, that's not at all the case. What tithing is and giving, and of course it is a problem in our world. In the American church, for instance, 2% of Christians actually tithe. That's giving 10% of their income. That's sad. Obviously the message hasn't made it through. But when we talk about stuff like that, people have these misimpressions or grumbling about it and venting about it makes them feel better about not being willing to come into alignment with where God is in the Bible on those kinds of topics. And so people grumble, and they get other people to grumble with them, and and it happens all the time. But, you know, tithing is a way. It's not a fundraiser. Tithing is how God grows Christians for the kingdom. It's a matter of trust and surrender, and it's an important one. But people grumble about that kind of topic more than maybe any other. Or maybe a favorite preacher isn't preaching the day that they show up and bring their friends, and they grumble about it. Or they play a new song that you don't like. And just as a reminder now, We're not actually worshiping you, and so the music wasn't for you, it's for God. And so it's okay if we don't like a song, that's not the point. Grumbling happens all over, though. It's not just in churches. Grumbling happens in our schools. It happens at work, around the water cooler. It happens on Mondays especially, right? It maybe even starts Sunday night, getting ready, like warming up for the grumble that's going to happen on Monday morning traffic, all those things. It happens everywhere we go. It happens in our families, happens in our marriages, and our children. My goodness, our children are expert grumblers. They have degrees in it, I think, in grumbling and complaining, and what I'm about to say will be hard to hear, but listen, our children probably learn how to grumble and complain so well because they see it modeled so often. You know, ultimately, we grumble when things don't go our way, when timing of things isn't what we expected it to be. We grumble when someone even thinks different than us these days. This is how the world has gone. Or if someone or even God doesn't live up to our expectations, we grumble and complain and mutter and murmur. (sighs) And social media. Social media has incubated it, creating a cesspool for grumbling to grow virtually unchecked like a disease, whether it's Facebook rants or maybe Facebook reviews. or You know what? There are entire pages on Facebook devoted to grumbling like concerned citizens of whatever. (laughs) That's what its mission statement is. Grumble here. Complain, mutter, murmur here about something you actually can't do anything about, but please come and complain. You know, I'd guess that entitlement thinking has probably created a lot of that in our culture. Uh, Probably not just entitlement thinking. I suspect it's materialism and the disease of comparison also can do that. I think that's a very biblical principle you'll see later. Or maybe just the false belief that my preferences are the only preferences that should or actually matter to me. And of course, there's the inability to disagree with anyone anymore civilly. It is impossible to disagree with someone and have a civil conversation, and that has come out of an entire culture 
not just around us, but an entire culture of critical, angry, condescending, grumbling people that use their words as weapons. Just watch the news. Two minutes. It's all you need. You'll see it. And if I'm not careful, I suppose right about now, someone may be thinking that I'm grumbling, trying to explain grumbling. (laughs) The truth is, I'm not. I'm not angry. I'm not trying to beat you up. I love you. I really do. And so sometimes when you love someone, you have to have hard conversations. And this is one of those because it's so challenging because critical spirits and grumbling hearts are epidemic. They're epidemic. It's everywhere. And the truth is, it's super easy to get there, including for me. There's there's no finger pointing in this. I've been pointing my finger at myself all week long. Here's the thing. I'm convinced that God needed me to be a pastor because I'm not smart enough to figure out a message by listening for 40 minutes to someone else. I got to wrestle for it for like 20 hours. And this is the only way it gets through my thick skull. We all struggle there. It's not just a you thing. It's a me thing. It's easy to struggle with that area. And I will be honest, there have been times just even over the last two or three days where I've caught myself wanting to grumble about something and go, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. (laughs) It happens. But here's the thing, guys. It is so, so dangerous. Grumbling and murmuring and muttering is so dangerous. And it is far from what God calls his church to. He calls his church to something so much higher and so much bigger because a grumbling, critical spirit destroys unity. It also destroys the Christian witness. I mean, think about it for a second. Who in the world would want to be a part of a religion where people are constantly grumbling and complaining? Who would want to be a part of that? A critical spirit destroys relationships. It destroys our ability to respond appropriately when things don't go our way. And I don't know about you, but things don't go my way a lot. But the great news in that is we can overcome, and we must. We can and we must overcome a critical spirit, a complaining mouth, and a grumbling heart. And the great news is God will show us how. And so I want to take you back to Job. Now, Job is the name of a person, but also the name of a book. And so the book of Job, which is about 42 chapters long, it's a big book. I encourage you to go read it. We don't have time to cover it well, just in a couple of Sundays, but there are some ideas and principles I want you to see in this. And so here's where it starts. I am sure that you have heard the phrase at some point in your life that so-and-so has the patience of Job, right? We've heard that. Well, it brings up the question, why? Because here's the deal. We can learn something from that kind of person. Because having patience usually is the opposite of having like a grumbling spirit, and so we want to talk about that. You know, last week, Kurt began this journey, and Kurt did a great job talking about uh, the beginning of the story of Job out of chapter 1. And so out of chapter 1, if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to it, and you're going to hear Kurt more. He did a fantastic job, right? That was super good. And you're going to hear him more and other people that uh, in the fall as we continue to develop a teaching team. But he talked about Job, specifically again chapter 1. And here's the big picture. Job lost everything. He loses everything, except probably the one thing that at some point in time he wished he had lost. And that was his wife, who was grumbling at him, curse God and die. Now... I don't want to ask at this point, can you identify? This would be so dangerous. Do not uh, admit to that at all. I can only imagine that Satan didn't take the wife out because Satan figured that by leaving the wife there, she would be able to cause him enough trouble that it was better to leave her there where she was having with this critical, critical spirit, a grumbling heart, telling Job to curse God. Curse him for this. And then just lay down and die. But in the history of the world... If anyone persisted in the times of great trial, it was Job. And again, the devil went after him hard. The devil went after everything that he had. But here's what we see at the end of chapter 1, verse 22. In all this, though, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Even though God had allowed everything to be taken away, even though God allowed his tragic loss of his family and possessions and health, Job did not curse God and die. 
Job did not sin against God or even charge God with the wrong. Job does mourn, though. He mourns those losses. He is broken. He's hurt. He's confused. He is suffering because he has lost everything. And his story affirms for us something we already know, which is bad things happen to good people. It just does. In fact, Jesus tells us this because so many people don't understand it. They think, well, once you become a Christian, no more problems, right? No, in fact, it's the opposite. And Jesus tells us in John chapter uh, 16, verse 33, this is what we see. Jesus affirms it. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. You see, there's such an important message in that. Here's what Jesus is promising. You won't find peace because of no pain that's not where peace comes from in fact where peace comes from is what god does inside of you in the middle of the trial that it's what jesus does in us in the middle of the trial he's willing to offer us peace in that there is no answer that says we'll never have trouble in our lives that's craziness but when bad things happen we are going to be broken over it. We are going to mourn. We are going to grieve. And one of the interesting things about the story of Job is we actually see stages of grief. As Job goes through this experience, as Job's unpacking it and trying to make sense of it, we see grief all over the place. Like chapter 2, he's in deep shock. Now, wouldn't you be in deep shock? You've lost everything. All of your wealth, your family, and your health. He's in shock. Chapter 3, he's in disbelief. Job continues to ask, why? 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 And of course, any of us would probably ask the same question in those moments. One of the ones that stands out to me is in verse 11, where he says, why didn't I just die? Why didn't I just die when I was born? By the way, the question of why is actually never answered in the entire book. It would be awesome if there were a conclusion to it in chapter 42, and here's why. And by the way, let me just say, there's really no easy answers to it anyway. But the, the book never tells us. Yes, I don't know for you, but for me, it seems unfair that Job loses everything like this. In our flesh, it's hard not to think that way. But the book itself teaches us to be careful in how we respond that way. The book itself is teaching us that there's no way that you and I have enough wisdom or knowledge to be able to make that judgment, much less be able to look at God and challenge him on his wisdom. None of us know enough. None of us have experienced enough to be able to do it. Disbelief. How about chapter 6 and 7? Job is angry. Wouldn't you be? Of course. It's a stage of grief. Job is angry. He's angry with his friends for judging him, not being the oasis that he needed. Instead, uh, facilitating the dry and weary land that he was living within. He's angry at them. He's even angry with God, but he's not going to cast his anger on God, and those are different things. But Job never cursed God or anyone else, and most importantly, in his anger, he did not sin. Now, Paul talks about this in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, says, be angry, but don't sin. Did you know that? That the Bible actually gives us permission to be angry, because we're going to anyway. When things don't go right, we can be angry, but don't sin in that anger. That's what makes it so hard. But Job didn't sin in his anger. In chapters 9 and 10, his anger did, though, give way to hopelessness. In chapter 10, verse 1, he said, I loathe my life. He felt trapped. He felt isolated from God. He felt like God was being completely silent with him in the middle of his trial. And it kind of makes sense. The teacher's always silent in the middle of the test. But he's silent, and what Job's doing is expressing his feelings to God. And we find it in the book of Job in a very poetic way. But Job is expressing his feelings, and you know what? God understands those honest feelings. God is not offended when we share how we feel with him. In fact, he invites us into it. Feelings like these are not sinful in and of themselves, but what we do with that brokenness, that can be sinful. We must be careful there to not act out in sinful ways in the middle of our brokenness, in the middle of our hurts, in the middle of our feelings. We cannot sin against God in that. And so Job's complaints, and he does complain along the way, they were sanctified by his humility and where he comes from with God. And so in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, it gives us a great principle for this entire thing. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, lift you up, casting all your cares and anxieties on him, because why? He cares for you. He cares for you. Job 
was a humble man, and he was casting his cares on the Lord. He was not grumbling, and God certainly exalted him eventually. Eventually, he exalts him, and we see it. Here's the thing, friends. It is okay to bring your disappointments to God. It's okay to be disappointed. And it's okay to bring those and your hurts and, yes, your feelings and your fears to God and allow his word to steady us. Because it is easy to feel off balance when we are broken and when we are hurting and when we're spiritually dry. It is easy to be off balance and we need God's word to steady us and hold us strong and to allow us to stand our ground in the middle of it. And so in Job's emotional roller coaster, he's all over the place, but also in his ignorance, he's all over the place. Now, it's always important to define this and explain it, and here's my answer always. Ignorance is curable. Stupidity is forever, but ignorance is curable. That means ignorance is, I don't know something. I don't know a million billion things, but it's curable that we can learn those things. And so part of Job's issue is he's working out of this emotional roller coaster, and he's working out of a place of ignorance where he just doesn't understand what's happening. And so Job actually demands that God show up and explain what is happening. I don't know if you've ever done that before. That's pretty bold, to demand that God show up and explain what's happening. In my mind, here's the way I picture it, that yes, it's like, God's holding a staff meeting and Satan's there to cause trouble and the people and the angels are there. This is what happens in the beginning. I continue to think in this courtroom setting and here's what's happening. Satan is the prosecutor and he's coming after them and he's pushing and pushing and Job is calling God to be his star witness to come and say that Job is innocent. This is the picture of Job calling God to come and explain it. It's not to necessarily explain himself, but it is to be a witness to show that Job actually has done nothing wrong. This wasn't out of his own sin, that he was innocent. And the book of Job continues to affirm it over and over again. But he still calls him in, and that's pretty bold. But again, God can deal with our feelings. God can deal with all this. And guess what? God does show up. God shows up in a whirlwind. Now, I'm not sure exactly what you would call that. Uh, there's all kinds of tornadoes. There's NATO. There's Sharknado. Believe it or not, there's six of those movies. I'm not sure how that happened. There's a, we're not in Kansas anymore, tornado. The best I can do is when we see here in Job 38, 1 through 11, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, it's a god NATO. That's what I think that is. Maybe you'll never forget it from this point on. Job, out of the whirlwind, said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. So God says to Job, You have no idea what you're talking about. You do not have wisdom to understand it. You just cannot understand it. So, dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Not the other way around. That's exciting little music for your pleasure there today. <laughs> and so God says to Job, I'll question you and you answer me. Now, this is still a scary moment. Can you imagine being there in Job's shoes? Come down here and you be my star witness and you tell all these people that I'm innocent and God shows up and out of a whirlwind tells Job, dressed like a man, I will question you and you will answer me. Now I gotta tell you, I, I had a moment very similar to this many years ago. In fact, it was probably um, nine years ago, somewhere in that ballpark, and Jennifer and I were discussing whether or not we should move to a place called Cabot, Arkansas, and plant a church. And so as I began to pray through it and work through it, God opened up the door for me to go out to Pepperdine University in Malibu, California, completely ugly place. You would never want to go there. That's a joke. I don't know if you caught that or not. To go out to Cal Malibu and to uh, speak at a big conference to speak at a conference <laughs> uh, out there in Malibu. And so I get there. I'm supposed to speak on Friday night. It's a big deal. I can't even focus on what I'm supposed to do. I'm there all week, and I'm petitioning God constantly and continually. I'm going up in the mountains. I'm fasting. I'm begging God, show me what I'm supposed to do. Do you want me to go to a place called Cabot, Arkansas, and plant a church or stay in Kansas City or go somewhere else? What do you want me to do? I just want to do it. And God is completely silent for days. And guess what? Like Job, I get a little angry. 
And I remember praying and saying, God, I just want to do what you want me to do. Just tell me, whatever it is, I'll go wherever, I'll do whatever. But you at least got to tell me. I'm trying to help. I'm trying to, you know, further your kingdom. At least talk to me. At least tell me what you want. And silence. And I remember one day, it was getting close to the time that I had to get up and speak in front of who knows how many people, and I can't focus. This is the only thing I can think about and I'm sitting behind the chapel, and I open up my Bible, and I begin to read, and I get to Psalm 115, chap- chapter 115, verse 3. And here's what it says. Our God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. When I read it, here's what I heard, though. Not necessarily with my ears, but it was the most impactful moment, and here's what I heard. I am God, and I will speak to you the way I want to speak to you. And I had some immediate repenting to do. We can bring all that to God and he can deal with it. But we want to make sure that that relationship is solid and we're not demanding that God do what we tell him to do. So this is important. All right, so we go back to Job then. And so God takes Job on this tour of the universe, basically. In order to help Job understand what's happening, he takes him on a tour and Job basically then gets to hear this from God. Hey, by the way, were you around when I made the universe? Were you here when I made the constellations? How about the sunrise? Did you see that? And even the dinosaurs, yes, it's in there. Were you here when I made all of this stuff? And this is one of those moments where Job has to understand that he can only see a small portion of the big picture. Job was not God. Neither are we. And so part of what God is doing with Job, I'm convinced, is painting on that canvas, bigger than our eyes can behold. But Job thought he could see the big picture, and he couldn't. He could only see this much, just like us. And so what God's commission to Job was, was to trust him. And what this does is it leads to Job's repentance. And Job repents. He apologizes for overstepping his bounds with God. We see it in Job 42, 1 through 6. Here's what it says. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. It's interesting, though, when you see this repentance. Job doesn't repent of his overt sins like his friends accused him of. He doesn't repent of covert sins like another friend accused him of. That's not what it was. Those implications against him, that's not what he's repenting for. Instead, he's repenting for speaking out of ignorance to God. That he had no idea what he was talking about. He just didn't understand the big picture. And so he raised questions out of his lack of understanding, as many of us do. But interestingly, and maybe even surprisingly, God declares that what Job said was right. That it was still right. Not that he wasn't hasty in some of his conclusions. That wasn't the point. It wasn't about that. God still approves, though, of how Job came to him in some sense. That he approves of how Job came honestly with all the emotion, with all the pain. Job just wanted to hear from God. Just tell me, show me, help me understand. And God says, this is the right way to process through pain, through prayer. To pray. Which ultimately is what Job was doing Job was faithful, and he was patient. He was. And God vindicated him before his friends. We see that in Job chapter 42. And eventually, here's what's amazing about the whole story. God restores Job. He restores everything that Job had lost. And so we see this heart and this attitude in lots of Bible characters. Not all of them. Like Daniel, he ends up in a place where he never would have expected, basically in captivity, studying things of the Chaldeans that he would never have studied as a Jew, but he has the opportunity then to lead in a way that is amazing, that he never would have had had he not been in captivity, but he doesn't grumble and complain to God about it. Or Paul. Paul ends up going as a Jew to Uh, the Gentiles. And the Gentiles don't care at all about what Paul understood. Paul was studying and probably on the fast track to being the high priest. He knew everything about Jewish law and custom, a Pharisee. He was a super Jew. He knew all those things. Yes, I said that. (laughs) But guess what? 
God didn't use him to go reach the Jews. His mission was primarily to Gentiles that didn't care at all about anything. And you would think maybe he would complain and argue, like, that's not what I prepared all my life for. How dare you have me go to these dirty Gentiles? I'm prepared to go to the Jews. And God said, this is where I need you. But he didn't uh, grumble or complain, even when he's beaten for it, bit by snakes, left for dead, shipwrecked. He doesn't grumble. And of course, Jesus, he doesn't grumble when he goes to that cross for you. He goes to the cross to die in your place, to pay the penalty of sin for all of us. He doesn't grumble or complain. Why? He willingly does it. Why? Because he loves you. That's why. He loves me. And of course, the Israelites, the people, the chosen people of God, guess what? They complained all the time. All the time they were complaining all the time about things like, we don't have any food. God gives them food. Now we don't like this food. And on and on it goes. And it goes all the way back even to Adam who grumbled to God about Eve in Genesis 3.12. The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree to eat. It's your fault, God. You did this to me. But how often do we do stuff like that? So what, though? Why is this important to us? Well, a critical spirit which gives rise to grumbling, and it does, when we see the world negatively, it will give rise to grumbling, that protest with a bad attitude. When that happens, it is obviously destructive. And we are called to so much more. Believers are clearly not supposed to be grumbling and complaining all the time. Philippians 2, 14, 15 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We've got to be careful about how we represent Jesus because we do live in a generation still, there's nothing new under the sun, that is crooked and twisted and unless we shine the light of Christ, they'll stay there. But we don't want them to stay there. And so our calling is to love and to love one another fully and deeply like first peter 4 9 show hospitality to one another without grumbling christian hospitality is different than entertaining entertaining is about the host and and the house but hospitality is about the guests and taking care of their needs this is why we do so many of the things we do here at renew and guess what when we do that stuff to serve other people to show them the love of christ i have found over and over again ministry is not convenient my greatest opportunities to share the gospel or to do something for God in a big way outside of this place because this place is not the church. We're the church. We have opportunities to make Christ known everywhere we go, not, not just because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian and you have the same. And so when we have those opportunities, it seems like my greatest opportunities are when I don't have time or it's inconvenient and I've got to make a choice. Am I going to grumble or complain or do what God calls me to? It's a decision we all get to make all the time. How about Galatians 5, 14 through 15? For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. Or James 4, 1 through 3, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and don't have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you don't ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. I will tell you, I think that goes a long way in explaining why people may grumble. Much of it comes from unfulfilled desires. We're not happy within us, and so we grumble. So what do we do with this? Now what? What do we do? How do we leave here with this in mind? Well, first of all, when people grumble against you, See if there's any truth in it. I know that's hard to hear, but don't retaliate. Instead, reevaluate, and let's always be humble enough to deal with whatever's messed up with God, to be able to bring it to him and allow him to sanctify us and clean us from the inside out. If there's something that we've done, always being humble enough to repent and to change course. Interestingly, one of Job's friends, as we read through the book of Job, Job chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, gives a beautiful picture of what repentance is. Even though he was not comforting ultimately to Job, he gives this beautiful picture. Here's what you would see. Redirect your heart, confess your sin to God, and turn away from any form of impurity and injustice. That's good. It's a good picture of repentance that we're all called to. But here's the other thing. Sometimes people will grumble about you or to you for no reason whatsoever. And so how do you respond in that? Well, I want the Bible to tell you the answer to that. Here it is, 
Romans 12, 17 through 19. Do not retaliate with evil. Regardless of the evil brought against you, try to do what is good and right and honorable as agreed upon by all people. If it is within your power, make peace with all people. Again, my loved ones, do not seek revenge. Instead, allow God's wrath to make sure justice is served. Turn it over to him. For the scriptures say, revenge is mine. I will settle all the scores. We may not like that because we want to exact justice, but God is just. And this is one of the things that we see in the book of Job, even though that was an accusation. Is God just? The answer is yes. Or 2 Corinthians 13, 11, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Or Ephesians 4, 31, 32, let all, listen to this, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Keep moving forward. Keep growing as a disciple and let your actions and words reveal the truth of who God is and who he is within you. And remember, he can deal with it much better than you can or me. And please, don't leave a great church because someone said something dumb to you. If I had a dollar. This is maybe a newsflash for you, but probably not. People will say dumb things. It's not a reason to run. It's a reason to practice love. And that's hard, I know. It's hard for me too. But instead of grumbling and mumbling, it's an opportunity to show the light of Christ. So, on the other side of this, if it's you that has the critical spirit, if it's you that has the grumbling problem, here it is. Make a commitment to stop grumbling. Right now, today, make a commitment to stop grumbling and maybe even throw gossip in there, another G word. No more gossip. No more grumbling. Those things so often go hand in hand. And Philippians 2.14 says this, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Listen, there's no get out of that one. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. This one would be a good one to make your children memorize, by the way. And so when you tell the kids to clean their room and they complain, you go, oh, what does Philippians 2.14 say? Do all things without grumbling. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful because it's like, you're going to argue with God on that one, buddy, or are you going to clean your room? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. But probably some of y'all, including myself, need to write that right on the windshield, right above the mirror before work tomorrow or maybe on your mirror at home a good reminder but it's true stop rolling your eyes stop huffing stop shaking your head it is the devil's playground for disunity and conflict always instead pray for love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control and then cooperate with god as he does the work inside of you to allow that fruit to be born. Maybe find an accountability partner. That helps. Say to someone, hey, if you catch me grumbling, would you call me on it and help me to not do it anymore? Make sure you have a grateful heart. You know, having a thankful, grateful heart is an antiseptic for grumbling, keeping track of how God has blessed you and all the good that you've seen. Replace grumbling with prayer. When you feel like you need to grumble, instead pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, 18 says, Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Every decision to grumble is a decision not to pray, and every decision to pray is a decision not to grumble. Become an oasis. Become an oasis, a place of refreshing. You're surrounded with people that in our, are in a dry and weary land, and they desperately need you. Become an oasis of comfort. Learn to endure discomfort without grumbling. This is the definition of patience. Endure discomfort without grumbling. So many people will say, don't pray for patience, because then God's going to... Guess what? If you need to learn patience, 
Allow God to do his work in you. You should pray for patience if you're not a patient person. It's okay. Don't pretend that you're God and determine what's right or not for you. Allow God to do his work in you. And then lastly, follow Jesus. Commune with the Lord daily, every day. If you are in that sweet spot with God, it makes the earthly challenges much less of a big deal. If you are filled with him and the spirit is moving in you, not just on a Sunday during a worship service, but on Monday on your way to work or wherever it is, if you have done a good job of filling yourself with goodness and filling yourself with love and hope and joy, it's much easier for that to come out than if you're in a dry and weary land within you because grumbling loves to pop out of that. So do what's necessary. Commune with the Lord even today, there's stations around the room where you can actually take bread that reminds us of the body that was broken, take a cup which reminds us of blood that was shed, and we can do this as a memorial, a reminder that Jesus died for you to have life and have it to the full so you can be with him forever. What a great celebration. If we could walk in that every day and live in the reality of what that means for us, oh, how much less we would grumble. And so today we have three songs, and I want to invite you to a time of communion. It's open to any who believe. They're all around the room. I invite you to a time of prayer, to a time of repentance, to a time of worship. And if you need help, grab someone and say, pray for me. I am dry and weary. Well, let me do it, or somebody, one of the pastors do it, but don't leave here dry and weary. Worship. Worship allow God to fill you with himself so what comes out of you is joy father God I pray now as we finish this time in your word as we now go into a time where we sing praises and celebrate all that you are let us really do that let us really worship and declare that you are worthy to celebrate you and all that you've done, especially the cross. Let us go to communion, and as we break the bread and take the cup, our eyes are open to see Jesus, and that there is, we realize there is nothing in this world worthy of grumbling about when we see the reality of the cross and what it means. Help us to walk in that, though, every day, not just on a Sunday morning. And so let us worship as if it's just you and me. Let us worship, not worrying about what anyone thinks. Let us commune and fill ourselves with all of you and experience your joy in every way. We praise you for what you've done and what you are about to do. Bring us to a place of repentance and surrender. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.